In the early morning hours of October 7, 2023, the IDF's 933rd Nahal Brigade quickly jumped into their brand new, untested Aton armored fighting vehicles. They raced off from their quick reaction post in northeastern Israel. The column sped at the breakneck speed of 120 km per hour down Israel's Highway 6. Their mission? Engage Hamas militants that had launched the terror attack along Zikam Beach. The militants had amphibiously infiltrated from Gaza in eight separate boats. Four Hamas boats were destroyed immediately by the 916th Patrol Squadron from Ashad Naval Base before they even reached the shore. However, the four other boats successfully made it to the beach and started attacking the kibbutz and the Bahad 4 military base. In what is now referred to as the Battle of Zikum, the Nahal Brigade in their Aton's rushed to defend the beachfront. They reportedly got there so quickly they were able to take out the militants while they were still stuck on the beachhead. But by 7 a.m. that morning, Israel had confirmed reports that their Bahad 4 base had been overrun. The Israeli Aton's immediately began to clear the nearby villages on their way to the base. This is one of the main recruit training stations for combat and non-combat arms for the IDF. What that means is there was at least 90 green recruits training here at the time. Six IDF officers were KIA trying to protect them during the battle that raged on for hours. One recruit was KIA in the fight. Then, the Aton started to regain the upper hand thanks to its remote-controlled 50 caliber machine guns, which successfully forced the Hamas militants to withdraw back into Gaza. An Israeli soldier who participated in the battle said this, We reached the area the fastest. This is our first advantage. We ran into terrorist vehicles and didn't feel anything. It's a powerful tool. We broke through gates and fences, then we helped evacuate the wounded and supply the troops. It would have taken much longer to prepare and move out with tracked vehicles to respond in this kind of emergency situation. In fact, the Battle of Zeekam Beach was the first time that the eight-wheeled vehicle was ever tested in combat, and it's actually still just in the introductory testing phases at the IDF. The Aton unit was able to do this without a single casualty. The successful use of the vehicle prompted the head of the IDF ground forces, Commander Yadi, to integrate the Aton into plans of the invasion of Gaza Strip. Critics claimed that the vehicle wasn't scheduled to go into full service for another entire year until sometime in 2024. Many opinions started popping up on X, Twitter, that state that the vehicle was, quote, prematurely rushed into service. They claim that the high-tech Aton was rushed into battle before they were ready for the test. But what do some of its capabilities tell us about how it might perform in urban combat? One Israeli soldier proudly called it the Tesla of APCs because it's extremely high-tech, gives you a smooth ride, and, and I think he said it before all that controversy. I, I don't know, I don't follow the drama closely. While there may be some truth to it being rushed out the gate, they actually appear to be functioning well so far. In fact, this article that I found from Breaking Defense from October 4th, just three days prior to the attack, shows their exclusive walkthrough of the Aton armored unit getting used to the new system and training on it and running drills. Photos released by the IDF themselves show the Aton operating on the ground in Gaza in November 2023. We can see this giant explosion plume in the background behind the vehicle. Sometimes we would use an armored vehicle in Iraq simply to take cover in when we exploded unexploded IEDs nearby, then we'd jump back out. But the interesting thing that jumps out from this photo is that the Aton appears to have been outfitted with spike anti-tank guided missiles and a 50 caliber machine gun. But those spike missiles aren't gonna be engaging enemy tanks what they're designed for in Gaza is to strike entrenched Hamas positions that are behind concrete. Its 18-pound missile has a new penetration blast fragmentation that's used to destroy enemy behind cover. You might be surprised to learn that the 50 caliber machine gun can have difficulty cutting through concrete. The second photo from the IDF in Gaza shows us something interesting. We see a dismounted fire team of IDF soldiers taking cover behind the Aton inside Gaza. This is a common tactic used by mechanized infantry where they advance along Inside the firepower and protection of the vehicle while dismounted. In the background, we can actually see what looks like the turret of a Merkava main battle tank. The Aton is specifically designed to operate alongside the Merkava tank, using their digital network system together. And the two are likely protecting each other's flanks here in a 360-degree security zone. Very important in urban warfare. 
One of the advantages of this system is that it's reported to have a 1,000 kilometer range or about 620 miles before needing to be refueled, which is about 120 miles greater distance than similar counterpart vehicles. This allows you to stay in the fight for a longer period of time. Sustaining operations in Gaza is difficult for Israel because extending these logistics lines even just a few miles into hostile territory is a tough job. This is a classic quick reaction force mission, and it's exactly the kind of response these relatively new vehicles were designed for. The key characteristics of a quick reaction force are speed, flexibility, and readiness. What this means is that these vehicles cannot afford the luxury of being a high maintenance vehicle. Part of the reason why the Aton was effective in this mission is because it can carry 12 soldiers, including nine dismounted infantry, a full squad that can rush out, and three vehicle crew that stay on the vehicle to maintain a support by fire position. The Aton vehicle is uniquely well suited for Israel because it's designed to traverse mountainous terrain environments that are found in the Golan Heights. The reason wheels work in its favor is because tracked vehicles on tanks tear up normal roads, and ironically they wear out much faster on a typical highway than it would uh, on an off-road terrain. This is why anytime we see tracked vehicles deployed over long distances, they're often loaded onto truck beds or trains. But that's a slow and cumbersome process and doesn't bode well if you need to respond to immediate threats along your border. It's like bringing supplies to the front lines, and they're also great for evacuating wounded troops quickly back to the rear. The new Iron Fist active protection system found on the Aton armor could be used as a screening force to knock down incoming RPGs and clear a path for heavier tanks. The Hebrew name Aton actually means steadfast or strong, which gives us some insight into what type of capabilities they want to project with this armored vehicle. But looking at the Aton, you might think to yourself, wait a second, isn't that just an Israeli version of the, the Striker or Boxer? Isn't that just a ripoff of the LAV? Wait, wait, wait a second, actually, why do all of those different vehicles look the same? It can be tough to classify a vehicle like the Aton, but most people call it an armored fighting vehicle, as opposed to an infantry fighting vehicle classification or armored personnel carrier. All of these different things can be similar, but they're usually distinguished based on its level of firepower. But the visual aesthetics is where most of the similarities end. Like the rest of their armored fleet, the Israeli Defense Force has a unique set of requirements that set this vehicle apart from its counterparts. But before we answer that, so the animations, video editing, and research in this video was only made possible thanks to this episode's sponsor, Goat Guns. But before you ask me, no, they don't fire. Can you even imagine the lawsuits if they did? I mean, just think about that for a second. But history and military buffs, former soldiers and gun nuts alike love getting these one-third scale mini model Goat Guns as a gift. The thing that really blew me away was the working dummy rounds that you can actually load into the magazines and the bolts that slide back just like the real thing. Every detail has been faithfully recreated to deliver an authentic experience. If you're looking for the perfect gift this holiday season, look no further. From the iconic AR-15 to the classic AK-47, these miniaturized masterpieces aren't just for display, they're interactive allowing you to assemble and disassemble these models, providing a hands-on understanding of firearms. Goat Guns make a unique and impressive addition to any collection. Click the link in the description or the pinned comment below to get yours today. So why do all those vehicles look the same? The development of the Aton incorporates decades of experience in hybrid urban warfare that resulted in the most heavily armored and technologically advanced wheeled AFE in the world. The Aton was first announced in 2016 and then it was field tested until 2018. I noticed something interesting about the interior here, so I had to interrupt myself real quick. The floorboards on the bottom are much higher than on the striker that I deployed with. It's clear that Israel has put a lot of armor on the underbelly underneath the soldier. Uh, back to you, Chris. It took about five years to develop, and it was only in 2022 that Israel selected the United States-based Oshkosh Defense to produce the hulls. These were created at the Merkava factory at Tel Hashmer in central Israel, although the production is an international effort since over 1 million individual parts need to be manufactured and assembled, and 34 computers need to be installed for a final product. 
Currently, production of the Aton is spread across 60 separate locations across Israel, so as not to put all their eggs in one basket. Because all of its capabilities and design features can be traced directly to problems with the 113. In 1972, through a material aid package, the United States donated massive numbers of their old M113 tracked armored personnel carriers to the IDF. The Israeli Defense Forces determined that its operational requirements were not met by the American APC. This is because the IDF relies on a very aggressive strategy of maneuver warfare. That means dozens of M113s found themselves decisively engaged against the enemy. Now, decisively engaged is a military term that means your military force is fully committed to a battle with the intent of achieving a decisive outcome or victory. It's the military version of maximum effort. The problem is the 113 was really only meant for a support role in the rear and was often wiped out when it found itself in direct combat. The decision to develop the ATOM was based on one of the lessons learned from an incident from the invasion of Gaza in Operation Protective Edge in 2014. At the time, a 113 had a technical error that deadlined it, so it was stuck. Militants took advantage and fired an RPG at the downed vehicle. Six IDF troops were KIA as a result of the catastrophic vehicle loss. To remedy this, the IDF began creating a series of armored personnel carriers, eventually culminating in the creation of the Namer Super Heavy APC. But tracked vehicles are like getting a degree in interpretive dance. It, it only gets you so far in life. While the Namer is a fantastically protected and capable platform, they're mechanically complex and most importantly, they're slow to deploy. So the IDF started to evaluate fast moving, quick reaction force vehicles like the American wheeled Striker platform. Israel determined that the Striker was a cheap, knockoff, off the shelf solution. The Striker was quickly rejected, with internet rumors stating that one IDF commander called the thing a piece of junk. Now, as someone who spent a ton of time on Strikers, um, that hurts. But he's not wrong, but it still hurts. Even though the increased speed of the Striker was a notable advantage, Israel knew that urban warfare would be their primary concern. The thin skinned armor of the Striker simply would not be enough protection in an aggressive asymmetric urban fight. Troop protection has to be the number one priority, even at the cost of other capabilities. Enter the Aton. Initial funding and loose requirements had been established in 2011, but budgetary restrictions kept development in limbo. Finally, increased funding and personnel was allocated by Israel's Ministry of Defense. Development of the concept was handed to Rafael Advanced Defense Systems. That's Israel's largest national military R&D conglomerate. Rafael would do the developing, while the tank and APC administration would provide government oversight. There is one thing that thankfully still has zero government oversight today, and that's whether or not you choose to like this video. That's between you, your family, and your god. The base level armor plating is made up of ceramic and titanium steel composite, which provides protection against 14.5 millimeter machine gun fire. Higher up armor packages stop kinetic penetrator Sabo rounds. It can stop 30 millimeter cannons. More importantly though, it can stop dual purpose shape charges from RPG fire that Hamas really prefers. The armor is classified specifically as NERA or non-explosive reactive armor. This means it consists of a combination of three metallic and non-metallic materials. Materials like rubber can diffuse the impact of a shock wave from an explosion. This effectively spreads out the generated force instead of trying to stop the round entirely. This gives the armor excellent multi-hit capability. This is the Iron Fist Active Protection System. This was actually designed by Elbit Systems, an Israel domestic company, in tandem with the Aton Armored Project. It has new capabilities compared to the old Trophy System because the Iron Fist crazy name aside, contains a more robust and capable radar system that more accurately detects where and most importantly what type of round was fired at your vehicle. It now has two launchers and four sensors that are linked to a radar and electro optics that can even shoot down incoming tank rounds. The new countermeasure computer solution has an improved 70% success intercept rate and can even target drones in the sky now, which is a brand new feature. In total, there's 10 cameras nested around the hull with both day and night sensors. This gets me especially excited because it means we're just one step away from video game style third person viewing. The Aton is noticeably larger than older designs like the Striker LAV. It's a full two extra feet length and three feet width. 
Much of that increased length comes from the size of its massive armored sponson boxes that you can see in the rear of the vehicle. They serve as extra storage space, which is very important, and it serves as kind of like an armored cover for the troops as they dismount out the back. In our Strikers, we couldn't fit our personal assault packs on the vehicle, inside the vehicle, or on the roof, so what we would do is we would throw them in the space between the hull and the armor on the exterior. It, it, was, it was pretty ghetto. Atons also weigh nearly double that of the American Striker counterpart, with base weights of 35 tons. It costs roughly $3 million each to produce at the current rate, about the same as the Namer cousin. Part of this increased cost could of course come down to the fact that the scale of which it was ordered. While the Aton is an Israeli homegrown design, roughly half of its components actually come from foreign sources. This was done in an effort to keep research costs low. The V-shaped hulk can allegedly withstand the blast of over 20 pounds of TNT. It's like 60 sticks of dynamite, and it would create a crater 10 feet big. This hull shape redirects that blast away from the hull to the sides of the vehicle, and that's why they've installed the Mobius blast absorbing seats. It's finally morbing time for real. It cleverly collapses and redirects the soldiers' inertia down as the hull is forced upward from an explosion. So it can actually navigate 60% vertical slopes and 30% horizontal slopes. It can even cross a six foot trench or forward up to four feet in water. But the big news is that the future models of the Aton will serve in a more infantry fighting vehicle role. This version is still being tested, but it's gonna have a 30 millimeter, it's a massive unmanned cannon turret controlled from inside by the gunner. So it's probably not gonna face off against enemy armor, so why do you need this giant turret? It would be useful for getting enemy forces out from hiding behind concrete. Actually, three variants in total are planned for production. You got your standard APC model, it's lightly armed. You got a command and control model, which trades troop carrying capacity for radio carrying capacity. And you got your IFV heavily armed turret model. These different versions fit into what's known as the IDF's two war strategy. The IDF expects to fight one type of war that's the conventional border invasions. This would involve crossing large open terrain against actual enemy armor. This means you would need larger caliber cannons. Then there's that second war that they fight that's the unconventional hybrid urban warfare, the kind we're seeing in Gaza right now. As international tensions and conflict began to rise over the past few years, the IDF made the decision in January of 2023 to outsource the entire whole production to the United States. The $100 million contract was negotiated by American Oshkosh Defense Company, which manufactures and produces a number of the military vehicles for the DoD, such as the new JLTV. This decision was made prior to the most recent attacks, and this will likely be expedited to quickly replace vehicles lost in the invasion of Gaza. Overall, the introduction of the Aton is, and many would agree, overdue, and brings what was already one of the world's most capable fighting forces to a level of performance and capability that will fit the strategic needs that they have for decades. For more updates, follow me at Cappy Army on Instagram, and check out one of these videos if you have another minute. Thank you for watching Spare Parts Army. If you found this video valuable in any way, please hit the like and subscribe button, and I'll see you again in a couple of days.